Miss Gaines? That's who I have on this one. Good morning, Your Honor. Joy Gaines, Senior Assistant Public Defender with and on behalf of Mr. Kyle. All right. What are we doing on this? Your Honor, I have a, we have made all necessary attempts to ensure that our victim is present today. However, she's not in attendance. I do have a forfeiture by wrongdoing motion that I have prepared and ready to file today um, as a result of her not being in attendance today. Um, I have it prepared and I can hand it to me. Uh, your staff immediately as well as send it electronically. Um, I do also want to note for the record that we had previously had a hearing to have the defendant's privileges revoked on the 28th um, that was then carried over to the court. On the 28th, you, we adjourned it out and didn't argue that motion. Um, but you revoked his phone privileges pending the hearing that was going to continue over until the 4th. On the 4th, there was no objection to his phone privileges being revoked. And so they should have been revoked at that time. However, that order was never provided to the jail by the court. And since the 4th, the defendant has made in total 129 calls to family and friends um, including his grandmother, who was the one who patched in the victim previously, which was the basis for that motion, which I filed back on the 28th. I have, because of the number of calls, I have not had an opportunity to listen to them all or frankly, any of them, but I am significantly concerned that what, what I did listen to back from the fourth was a call between the defendant and his grandmother, in which he indicated he knew he was not supposed to have his phone privileges, but that he was going to continue calling because he did have his phone privileges. I'm concerned, uh, and I, I do, like I said, have the forfeiture by wrongdoing motion. I will say clearly for the record, I did not see any calls to the victim's phone number. So I, I believe that that was successfully blocked by the jail. But because I haven't had the opportunity to listen to the calls, I don't know if his previous methodology of having her patched in was used to continue to contact in at a, of any kind. Got it. Ms. Gaines. Your Honor, this is the first I've heard of this. Last uh, information um, I had from Ms. Barroso was that she would be requesting an adjournment so that she could file the forfeiture motion. That's the last information I have. I have not had an opportunity to discuss this with my client. He has indicated that he, um, there has been no contact with the complainant. And, you know, certainly that was the primary intention of the, of the order. And he, as indicated previously with Mr. Bannis, has no objection to his phone privileges being revoked. Is that correct, sir? So I'm going to make it very clear. Defendant's phone privileges are hereby revoked. I will set a mo the hearing on the motion for forfeiture by wrongdoing for May 9th, 2024 at 3 p.m. I will adjourn then the defendant's preliminary examination to my following date of May 21st, 2024, 9 a.m. before me. And we'll continue. Thank you. Your Honor, we did want to uh, address, address Bond, if we may briefly. Go ahead. Your Honor, uh, Mr. Kyle does have a union job that at this time is his understanding continues to wait for him. He also has his own apartment, his own home that he um, hopes to be able to go back to the job and to maintain that home. He also states, um, it's also my understanding that he is a parent. We are asking that the court reduce his bond. It's my understanding that it's currently $100,000, 10%. We're asking for it to be a $10,000 cash assurity bond. 
Your Honor, just so the record is clear, this is not the only case holding him. He does have a witness intimidation case resulting from his contact with the victim here that is up for PCC on Thursday. In that case, there is an additional 100,000, 10%. We did request 250,000 cash or surety in that case. Here, we, re we requested 100,000 cash or surety. The reason for that is because in this particular case, the defendant woke up his victim, who was the mother of his child, by strangling her and threw her to the ground. And then when she tried to call 911, he took her phone, called his grandmother, the person he's been contacting on the jail calls, and his grandmother told him not, told the victim not to call 911, which is the basis for count two of interfering with electronic communications. At this time, we are hoping that the witness intimidation that's up on Thursday, we'll be able to catch up with the PE in this case, and we can handle it all at once. But I would object to any reduction in bond here. Motion for bond reduction is denied. Bond will continue. Court calls the case People versus Jason Stevens. Assistant Prosecutor. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Olga Yermolink on behalf of Mrs. Stevens, who is present. Your name, sir? Jason Stevens. On behalf of probation, Your Honor, victim is in this case present and would like to address the court. All right. You two step back and... Hello. Hello, Judge. What's your name? My name is Kashmir Morley. All right. Very good. What would you like to tell the court? When I was 24, just barely out of college, I applied for a job as a note taker for an exhibit design company in Ann Arbor. I met Jason for the first time as an interviewer. We talked about career goals and how I was really interested in a graphic design role, though I was willing to take on other hats to get my foot in the door somewhere creative. Months later, he would hire me as just that, a graphic design contractor for his company. For two years, I did small projects for him, working my way up to be his design assistant. I was 26 at that time. For those two years, we forged what I thought was not only a creative partnership, but a friendship. I look back over that time now and see that those were two crucial years where he felt my trust and my friendship as a form of predatory grooming. What did the title design assistant entail? Doing everything for this man, and I mean that quite literally. Me out to lunch one day on a long solo work trip back from Kentucky, where he and I would be sitting alone to tell me that he and his wife were in an open relationship, something I would later come out, come to find was a lie to get in my pants. I remember feeling uncomfortable about him sharing this with me, me, his female understudy, who at the time was in an almost decade-long romantic relationship of my own. I chalked his transparency up to our close friendship and didn't put much thought into it again until he started bringing this up quite frequently. If you ever want to have some fun, let me know, he told me one day. I think you and I would be amazing together. I was, again, 26, and my long high school sweetheart relationship was falling apart, though no one knew, including Jason. Jason was 47 at this time and married with a child. Eventually, upon his probing, I would share with him that I was fresh out of leaving a long-term significant other. At this point, I was only two years out of college. My career was just starting to form. I was in a position of fragility in my life, and he knew that. I told him I didn't think it was a good idea. I told him that crossing that boundary would ruin our work relationship. He said to me words that would come back to haunt me. In September of 2023, you'll always have your job no matter what. The what became years and years of sexual abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, abuse of power. The what became me telling him no and it happening anyway. I noticed that Jason began taking away work tasks for me whenever I wouldn't sleep with him. Every day I came into the office to do my job instead became a game of mental gymnastics for me. Is he going to tell me I'm fired again today for no reason at all? Will he tell me I'm no longer working on this project for no reason that he can give me? The abuse was constant. If it wasn't emotional, it was physical. It took me four years of abuse to realize that there was an end to that sentence that he never spoke out loud. You'll always have your job no matter what, unless you tell anyone what I'm doing to you. I sat in my office the day he assaulted me, staring at my phone where I had typed 911. My finger hovered over that call button for what must have been 10 or 15 minutes. If I called, I knew my job was over. I knew I'd wake up the next day unemployed. I knew he would fire me for telling someone about his inability to keep his hands to himself. But the alternative was to keep letting him hurt me, and I couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't take one more day of the abuse. I would lose a month worth of wages after making that call. 
I would spend thousands in therapy trying to make sense of what he had done. I would worry about paying rent. I would worry about feeding myself, about keeping a roof over my head. And then I would begin to worry that he would harm me further. In October, after the 911 call and Jason's arrest, he began to threaten me. He left a handwritten threat in my mailbox telling me to do the right thing in the middle of an impending trial. And I do say leaves because there was no forwarding address on that letter. Someone had to come drop it off at my house. And can you guess who was the only person at work who knew where I lived? When I didn't do exactly what Jason said, he started to show up at my house unannounced. He drove by my home and parked in front of my apartment dozens of times in an effort to make me feel unsafe, to make me feel like I had no other choice but to drop the charges against him if I wanted this to stop. Do you see a pattern? Jason has a back entrance from his house to his rental apartment, meaning he would not have to see me or be near my house at all if he wanted to check on his rental unit. Yet I continue to see him drive and park down my street. Any way imaginable that he could try to make me feel afraid is what I've had to live through and deal with since I called the police. When I didn't drop the charges, he started emailing me when there was a no contact order. And in every email, there was a threat. And every threat was sent from a fake name, from an email he and I set up for the sole purpose of setting up technology on the work site. I know this because I worked for him for six years. If Jason had actually wanted to message me something pertaining to work, he could have emailed me from his Jason at handle as he had done for the past six years. But instead, he sends me back intellectual property that he stole from me from a fake name, minus anything I worked on for him, leaving me bereft for my own portfolio moving forward, and then tells me, I hope you got what you needed and we're in the clear weeks before we're about to appear in court together. Jason J. Stevens, I am not afraid of you. Your threats do not work. It took me six months of intensive therapy to realize how badly he was abusing me. I entered the relationship with him consensually, but the abuse I endured was not consensual. The most disheartening part of this whole ordeal is being an up-and-coming young woman in a predominantly male profession and experiencing betrayal, mistrust, and abuse by someone I considered a mentor and with whom I looked up to. Jason could have made a difference in this world for not only young women like me, but young women like his daughter by holding his company to a higher standard than the one he created. And yet I am standing here today to hold him accountable for the actions he has done because he has chosen to do the opposite. I suggest battery intervention for Jason's probation. Jason chose to create a toxic workplace that is unsafe for any woman who steps foot on his job site. He created a world where women fail the moment they come to work. And if I have anything to say about that, that stops today. Ma'am, I just want to clarify something. Thank you for that. Um, are you indicating that... I think I'm aware of some of them, but that there was contact or alleged contact while this matter was. Yes. At what points? Because every month as I was listening, as I was listening to you, I don't, I don't think I have all of that. And I don't know that that's been taken into account with sentencing before you answer. Ms. Valera. I, yes. I don't have anything judge. So I'm, I don't. Yeah. Your Honor, oh. we did raise the issue of the note on the document, which was delivered by the defendant at the trial date. But the additional information, we, the additional context, we did not know. Okay, I had a so point. that's what I'm a touch bit concerned about that I don't have everything in front of me. Um, I realize what you said in terms of where they were sent from, how you recognize them, whatever, but mm -hmm. you still have those? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I had a whole FOIA document that I had forwarded, I think, to Christine at one point. Okay. So, um, all right. I I think I want those. Okay. To, I want certainly Miss Polera to have those. I can certainly give those to you. Um, the other... Thing that I'm wondering, and and it kind of gets beyond the court's province, I think. You, you don't have this. You don't have this. Um, as as I'm, I understand that there was a work relationship, but there was also an intimate relationship at some point. Were we aware of that? Because here, here's my concern, um, particularly given 
what's been requested as I'm reading the recommendation from probation. I I would think that this would need to more look like or should look like a DV sentencing as opposed to um, what it's charged as an assault and battery sentencing. I don't, I'm not saying go back and try to charge them. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying in terms of the structure of the sentence, given at least what I'm hearing here, I think that that may need to be examined, particularly in terms of. And, Your Honor, I, I also know that Ms. Morley is asking for restitution. Um, in the recommendation for probation, I was asking for a restitution hearing to be set. Given light um, of her statement to the court um, and probation being unaware of continued contacts and her indicating that she has proof of those, probation would ask that the sentencing be adjourned where we where I can reevaluate and look at everything um, to provide the proper recommendation um, for sentence, as well as maybe address restitution all in one. Yeah, well, and that's what I was I was going to do that mainly because of the initial thing that was said regarding the contact because I don't have that um, and can't take that into account. I guess the other okay and I realize at this point it's in essence an allegation the, the contact has occurred how often it's every month since he was arrested so between october and um, march i would say that was in january yeah so there was contact in march yes Or the very end of February to March. I can't remember the exact date, but it would have been like the last week of February, March. Hey, ma'am, let me just ask you, when these when this contact would occur, what did you do with that? Um, I sent it to the um, cop who was dealing with all of this originally. Pardon? I sent it to the cop who was handling this case originally, or I called, um, you know, 911. So it's all documented. Oh, well, that, I, I get that. But I'm... So, so you didn't get any notice from the officer in charge of this case whatsoever about any violations that were sent to them by the victim he had a separate um oh what is the word um i'm blanking on the word for his arrest in march because of the stalking and harassment a um oh not complaint he had a warrant out for his arrest in march because of all of the stalking and harassment <laughs> okay hold on there's a warrant you said there was a warrant out for him Mm -hmm. Out of where? 14A District Court. Do I have anything? The bench one issued March 4th, but I don't see why. March 4th on, on this case? On this case. I issued the warrant for failure to comply with bond conditions. Is that still active? No, I show it's canceled. It was canceled 
March 27th. Um, when he came back, and that was part of the violations that he admitted to that I'm taking into account in sentencing. So I get that one. But that's all I see. That's all you see in our system. So, ma'am, you're of the understanding that there was a warrant of a new charge? No, that's the same one that I'm thinking of. Okay, that that came out of this. Yes, yeah. got it. Yep. Okay. So, but so all of what you relayed to me today, in terms of these contacts, those were sent to Pittsfield Township Department of Public Safety. Yes. Okay. Or Ann Arbor as well, because I live in Ann Arbor. And so there was like a jurisdiction issue. And the cop said that he couldn't handle anything that was not in Pittsfield. So when he said, dropped the letter off at my house, that was Ann Arbor. So maybe that's the issue too. So, so some of this is in Ann Arbor. Yep. Some of it's in Pittsfield. Yep. Okay, beautiful. All right. And the prosecutor doesn't. Okay. So we'll have to round that all up. Ms. Yermolenko, is there anything you wanted to say regarding the request for an adjournment regarding the I don't have We're not going to additional contact allegations. We're aware of the, we do two email contacts in obviously January. That's what the Warren Bond violation was for. We addressed it at the last. Correct. It was set aside. Um, all those additional allegations I've never heard of previously, and I would like to see those police reports. So, I can leave them for your case. Okay. And I do also want to note for the record, I just ran through my email. I did not get anything directly from Ann Arbor or Pittsfield with regard to a bond violation. We did receive an email from Ms. Morley regarding the FOIA that she, the information she received from the FOIA. I also just checked our internal file system and the only case for Mr. Stevens, which shows all of the warrants that have been submitted as well, is this case. There is nothing. It's nothing. Okay. Office. So there all has right. not been an additional warrant request from Ann Arbor or from Pittsfield with regard to this case. Got it. Or, I should say. Hey, I, I spoke to the Pittsfield officer myself when we found out about the warrant. He did not mention any additional context, but once again, that's, we were not aware of the additional Okay, right. Got it. Okay, and so that I'm also aware, and the the claim for restitution is for right, general. Yes, yeah, she's asking for um, to cover therapy. Got it. She did provide some um, receipts. We've taken a look at those today. Um, I, I don't think that I have everything. I think that she may be looking um, for additional. Got it. Okay, so May is probably not is going to be too soon. Or, I mean, it's not too soon for me. I want everybody to be able to do the work. That's so. That's my concern. And Ms. Yermolenka has risen and she probably isn't available. Oh, of course not. But I have another problem with the team that reports. Well, no, we don't do that. What about the 22nd? Your work? Okay, ma'am. So what I'm going to do is I will adjourn this to May 22nd, 2024 at. 9 a.m. Um, I'm so sorry. I thought it was going to be in the hour. Whoa. Now you're throwing things? Okay, yeah. You thought it was going to be in the hour. I, I did. I am scheduled to be in the Greenwood Heights District Court all morning. That morning. No way. I'm available in the afternoon. Um, is it? Is that one in the morning? It is. It is. Yeah. Um, I, but I will. I, I will. will also be gone that day. Is it possible? Oh, heck, I'm going to get out of town, too. So we'd have to go to the next. June 12th. 
It's June 12th work for everybody. 10 a.m. work. I have a sleep at 9. He'll wait. <laughs> no. Okay. No, go there. Let us know. Well, of course, you're you're just right up to sleep. Yeah, that last famous last word. June 12th, 2024 at 9 a.m. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.